We are back on the record on People versus Larry Nasser, docket 17-526, FH Council for the record. Good morning, Your Honor. Angela Poblitis, P58430, on behalf of the Michigan Department of Attorney General. Good morning, Your Honor. Robin Liddell, on behalf of the people with the Michigan Attorney General's Office, P68287. Good morning, Your Honor. Chris Allen, Assistant Attorney General for the People, P75329. Good morning, Your Honor. Laura Rudy, Chief Deputy Attorney General. My number is 15994. Thank you. We also have uh, Detective Lieutenant Andrea Munford from the Michigan State University Police Department, the officer in charge. Thank you. On behalf of defendants. Good morning, Your Honor. Matt Newberg, on behalf of Larry Nassar, you see it to my left. And we have just we represent civil attorneys seated at council table. All right. Thank you. I don't have any objection to that in this crowded courtroom. Thank you. Next. Judge, the next survivor that you will hear from reached out to me earlier this week um, to determine whether she could speak today. She has not publicly disclosed her abuse, but is comfortable with being publicly identified today. And I'd like um, to introduce you to Jordan Weber. Ms. Weber. Jordan Weber, J O R D Y N W I E B E R. I first of all want to thank you for allowing us to speak here. I thought that training for the Olympics would be the hardest thing that I would ever have to do, but in fact, the hardest thing I've ever had to do is process that I'm a victim of Larry Nasser. It has caused me to feel shame and confusion. And I've spent months trying to think back on my experience and wonder how I didn't even know this was happening to me and how I became so brainwashed by Larry and everyone at USA Gymnastics, both whom I thought were supposed to be on my side. I started seeing Larry Nassar at the age of eight right here in my hometown of Lansing. He was known as the best gymnastics doctor in the world. Everyone at my club, on the U.S. national team and across the country saw Larry and everyone said the same thing. He was a miracle worker and he could fix just about anything. I was treated by Larry for any and all of my injuries from ages 8 till I was 18. And it wasn't long before he had gained my trust. He became a safe person of sorts. And to my teenage self, he appeared to be the good guy in an environment that was intense and restricting. He would try to advise me on how to deal with the stresses of training or my coaches. He would bring us food and coffee at the Olympics when we were too afraid to eat too much in front of our coaches. I didn't know that these were all grooming techniques that he used to manipulate me and brainwash me into trusting him. And when I was 14 years old, I tore my hamstring in my right leg. This was when he started performing the procedure that we are all now familiar with. I would cringe at how uncomfortable it felt. He did it time after time, appointment after appointment, convincing me that it was helping my hamstring injury. And the worst part was I had no idea that he was sexually abusing me for his own benefit. I knew it felt strange, but he was the national team doctor. Who was I to question his treatments or even more, risk my chance at making the Olympic team or being chosen to compete internationally? And after all, he was recommended by the national team staff, and he treated us monthly at all of our national team camps. I had even talked to my teammates, Ali Raisman and Michaela Maroney, about this treatment and how uncomfortable it made us feel. None of us really understood it. After I made the Olympic team, I suffered a stress fracture in my right shin. It was extremely painful to tumble and land using my legs, but I fought through the pain because it was the Olympics, and I knew it would be probably my only shot. Can you slow down, Jim? Yes, ma'am. Our bodies were all hanging by a thread when we were in London. 
Who was the doctor that USAG sent to keep us healthy and help us get through? The doctor that was our abuser. The doctor that is a child molester. Because of my shin, I couldn't train without being in extreme pain, and it affected the number of routines I could do to prepare before the competition. And ultimately, it made me feel less prepared than I should have been. I didn't qualify to the all-around competition, and I went through a dark time right before we won the team gold. Now, I question everything about that injury and the medical treatment I received. Was Larry even doing anything to help my pain? Was I getting the proper medical care? Or was he only focused on which one of us he was going to prey on next? What was he think about when he massaged my sore muscles every day? Now I question everything. To this day, I still don't know how he could have been allowed to do this for so long. My teammates and I were subjected to his medical care every single month at the National Team Training Center in Texas. He was the only male allowed to be present in the athlete dorm rooms to do whatever treatments he wanted. He was allowed to treat us in hotel rooms alone without any supervision. He took photos of us during training and whenever else he wanted. Nobody was protecting us from being taken advantage of. Nobody was even concerned whether or not we were being sexually abused. I was not protected and neither were my teammates. My parents trusted USA Gymnastics and Larry Nassar to take care of me, and we were betrayed by both. And now, the lack of accountability from USAG, USOC, and Michigan State have caused me and many other girls to remain shameful, confused, and disappointed. I'm angry with myself for not recognizing the abuse, and that's something I'm struggling with today. But even though I'm a victim, I do not and will not live my life as one. I am an Olympian. Despite being abused, I worked so hard and managed to achieve my goal. But I want everyone, especially the media, to know that despite my athletic achievements, I am one of over 140 women and survivors whose story is important. Our pain is all the same, and our stories are all important. And now, the people who are responsible need to accept responsibility for the pain they have caused me and the rest of the women who have been abused. Larry Nassar is accountable. USA Gymnastics is accountable. The US Olympic Committee is accountable. My teammates and friends have been through enough, and now it's time for change because the current and future gymnasts do not deserve to live in anxiety, fear, or be unprotected like I was. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words. You have an Olympian voice. People will listen to you. I've listened to you. You are really very strong, not just as an athlete, but as a woman, as a survivor. I know you'll get past this because of that strength because you have the strength to come here and talk. It's really important because what you're doing is helping to set a new precedent that all victim survivors should speak out and that all victims have a right to speak out. And your young self did not know that, but you have already, with what you've done in our community and so many others and in the world, molded so many young minds and people. What you've just done now is equally important, maybe more important, because they will listen to you. They will speak out like you. They want to be you. You have nothing to be ashamed about. I'm so honored that you came to tell your story here today. Thank you. Thank you. Survivor is a minor, um, and she will be accompanied by her mother, and um, they've asked me to stand with them as well, and I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm.
She's okay with being identified. I want to put that on the record and confirm that before I. All right. Let me know when you're ready. This is Chelsea's mom, uh, Chelsea Zerfus, and um, I'll let you question her mom. This is also her coach, who's going to be standing um, with us as well. All right, thank you. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to provide with you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. Thank you. Can you put your hand up? Could you state and spell your name for the record? Roberta Zerfus, R-O-B-E-R-T-A-Z-E-R-F-A-S. And you are the mother of the beautiful young woman in front of me? Yes, I am. And how old is she? Fifteen. And you know as a minor, she does not have to be identified. Yes, I do. And you had an opportunity to discuss what's going to happen here today, that she will be public, her name, everything that she says will be public? Yes. And she and you are okay with that? Yes, we are. And do you believe that's in her best interest? Yes, we do. Thank you. Just for the record, I do have a photograph with court. Ma'am, no one forced, threatened, or promised you anything to make this decision. Is that correct? I'm asking you about it. Is that correct? You've not been promised anything to no. testify or be paid to testify no. or uh, anything. You're doing this in your freedom. Yes. All right, thank you. All right. Nice loud voice and slow. I mean, to hear your name and then spell it for the record and then you may um, read your statement or something to talk whenever you're comfortable doing okay but slowly. Okay. Um, Chelsea Zerfus, C-H-E-L-S-E-A-Z-E-R-F-A-S. Would you like me to know? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for having me and allowing me to be here and speak. Being a victim of sexual abuse leaves you with a horrible feeling. Larry took advantage of me and many others. He abused his powers. He horribly manipulated me and invaded my personal boundaries. I've done gymnastics ever since I was six years old. I love gymnastics so much and always wanted to improve. I wanted to be the best gymnast I could possibly be. I loved being in the gym and learning new skills. I was 12 years old when I started seeing Larry Nassar. When I found out that I was going to him and having him as my doctor, I was very happy and excited. Why wouldn't I be? He was known as one of the best doctors in the world. I had someone that I thought I could trust more than anything. His practices at MSU also made me safe. Why would it not? I was taught to trust doctors because they are there to help you. So I trusted Larry. You said that you would help me get better and I believed in you. He took advantage of me along with many other innocent lives. It hurt me most when I found out that you hurt my teammates, the girls I loved most. I considered them my family. When I was seeking treatment, Nasser told me that I had torn a muscle in my stomach. He assured me that he would help me heal. After the first visit, Nasser insisted that I lose, wore loose shorts to any appointment at MSU or his home. I didn't understand at the time what wearing loose shorts had to do with my stomach. I now realize that he did it for easier access to my body. He even managed to sexually abuse me while my mom was in the same room as me. He manipulated me so much that I didn't know what was going on. Larry acted as if he was a friend. He would greet me with a sickening smile every time I saw him. I remember him liking my posts on Instagram. It's weird to think that an older male doctor was liking a little girl's post and commenting Merry Christmas on Christmas morning. I feel that MSU was an enabler. I should have never been assaulted there along with other girls. MSU knew of the assaults from 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2004, and 2014. 
MSU needs to be accountable for their actions. I trusted both of them. I was told it was a legitimate medical treatment. You were so nice to me and it made it easier to take advantage of me. It's so sickening that he did that to me. Larry used an innocent 12-year-old for his own pleasures. Larry Nassar is a monster. Not only did MSU fail to keep me safe, but so did USHE. Complaints have came forward for so long and they did nothing about it. Gymnastics is supposed to be a safe and happy environment. USAG failed to keep their gymnasts safe. Shame on them. This has had a huge impact on me. I get uncomfortable about what Larry was doing to me, but he reassured me that it was legitimate medical treatment, and of course I trusted him because he was an Olympic gymnastics doctor. I got scared and avoided going to practices because the treatment made me uncomfortable, even though he kept reassuring me that it was all normal. I avoided going to practice when I knew I would have to see him. The gym was no longer a happy environment for me. Not only did I stop going to his appointments, but also physical therapy. I kept things to myself. I didn't want to have to tell my parents that I was one of the patients abused by Larry Nassar. I didn't want them to worry about me. When I finally came forward to my mom about the situation, I couldn't finish my sentences. I stood there trembling and bawling my eyes out. I didn't want to face reality. I started to get anxiety after seeing all the news reports about him. I felt like I couldn't breathe and I would tremble in fear. I have nightmares about what happened and have troubles with sleeping. I've been put on anxiety pills just so I can function throughout the day. It's hard for me to trust people because of you. I get scared and uncomfortable when I have to go to the doctors. I get scared that I'll be taken advantage of once again by another doctor, just like you did. I try my best to trust doctors, but I can't. Larry ruined that trust. I went through a time where I wouldn't go to school. I would cry uncontrollably. I felt like I couldn't be at school because I was a victim of Larry Nassar. I felt better alone in my familiar room. I've tried my best to gain back the strength I once had. Nothing is easy at all. I just knew that I couldn't let him take gymnastics away from me. You, Larry, ask for forgiveness and want us to heal. This is all your fault. We wouldn't be here in the first place if it wasn't for you. We all would be living our normal lives, but instead you caused this issue. I will never forgive you what you've done to me. You're a coward and a sickening man. You did this to me. You're the one causing all this pain. While us survivors are carrying on with our lives and succeeding, you'll be rotting behind bars where you belong. You don't deserve to see the light of day. I'm not weak of this, but have grown as a person and become stronger. I am a survivor. Here I am today facing my abuser. I'm finally being heard. I'm no longer hiding my story. I ask that you give Larry and Asar the maximum sentencing possible for his horrid crimes that he has done over decades. Knowing that he'll be locked up will help me feel safe. I hope that abuse is brought up more and people become aware of how big the issue really is. It makes a difference to have the abuser accountable for their actions. Thank you. That was a very strong, brave voice. And I hope that now that you've spoken publicly, you leave your pain here with him and you live a long, happy life. You are not alone anymore. All these people support you. Your sister survivors support you. And it's so important what you've done. You just one of the first things you said is that you were so worried about your teammates and others that you did this to and you thought of others instead of yourself. And you are, with your young voice, helping countless other young people who are in the same situation who we don't know about. You're giving them the strength to come forward to their parent and their coach, somebody, and say no. And that's what you've done. I'm so very proud of you. This doesn't define you. This strengthens you. You've shown that today. Congratulations, Mary. Thank you.
Um, Your Honor, the next survivor is Samantha Ursh, and she is accompanied uh, at the podium by her coach Patrick, and I'll let him give you the last name. And she has agreed to be publicly identified, and I have displayed a photograph of um, Samantha as well. Thank you. And sir, what is your full name? Uh, Patrick Hullion, H-U-L-L-I-U-N-G. Patrick's correct sir. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you for being here. Thank what you. What would you like me to know on first date and spell your name for the record? I know you have your statement there. Please read it in a slow space. Okay. I will. Okay, so we can understand it, okay? okay. Thank you. My name's Samantha Ursh. It's S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A. U R S C H. Yeah. Your Honor, thank you so much for letting me speak today. I have been in the courtroom all week, and I know you mentioned this is just your job, but there's a difference between doing your job and doing it extraordinarily. You are helping all of us to heal with your words to each of us. Once again, one thing I realized this week is it is okay if I didn't include all of my feelings into this statement I've written because all of these strong women have spoken them at some point this week and you are helping all of us even the people who aren't here begin to heal I can't thank you enough for that as I sit down here to write this tonight all I can think about is how much easier it would be to not do it to keep living my life like none of this ever happened, just like I did for five years between my senior year of college and September 13, 2016. However, it's time for me to move on, and this is how I'm going to start. I fell in love with the sport of gymnastics when I was three and competed until I was 22. Over the years, I've been proud to call myself a gymnast. But in my senior year at Central Michigan University, one doctor's appointment permanently changed the way I think about the sport I dedicated so much of my life to. To understand why, I need to tell you what happened. Throughout my gymnastics career, I was relatively healthy. No broken bones or major surgeries. That changed my freshman year of college when I tore my ACL. Coming back from surgery meant I was always the backup, fighting for a spot on my college team and pushing through the pain to do so. After my knee surgery, I began having severe muscle spasms and lower back pain. After four years, my last opportunity to compete was senior night, our last home meet of the season. Since I had tried everything else to help my back pain, and since Mr. Nasser was so close to CMU, many people suggested I go see him. One of my teammates was seeing him for another injury, and she called to ask if I could tag along to her appointment. Nasser agreed. My first appointment with Mr. Nasser went really well. I felt so lucky that the same man working with the Olympians made time for me. When I arrived that day, he knew exactly who I was. He knew the gymnastics club I attended, that I hadn't really competed in college, and why. He made me feel just as important as anyone else. Even better, his x-ray and assessment gave me a clear diagnosis. I was so glad to finally be able to tell my coaches and teammates why I was in so much pain that I carried around my medical records and x-rays from my visit. It was what happened at the next appointment that I never saw coming. It was gymnastics season, so my schedule was crazy, but Nasser's office was nice enough to fit me in at the end of the day. I drove an hour from Mount Pleasant to this appointment by myself, and everything just seemed to go as it had before. It wasn't until one of the office staff members entered the exam room to tell Nasser she was leaving for the evening that I thought, that's odd. I wonder if all his staff let him know when they have to leave. It wasn't until later that I realized this meant I was completely alone in the office with him. I wish I would have realized sooner. Not long after, Nasser informed me there were other things he could do to make the myofascial release and massage he was performing on my upper legs less painful. He told me it was a little invasive. I had no idea this meant he would be inserting his fingers into the most private areas of my body. My head was spinning. 
Is this supposed to be happening? I thought, something isn't right. Can I get an infection from this? I guess not. He has to know what he's doing. He's a doctor. When the appointment was over, he asked if I was feeling better. I wasn't sure how to answer because I wasn't sure what had just happened. I went to exit back towards the lobby where I had entered. All of the lights in the entire office were off and he said, you can just go out this side door. I remember walking down a back stairwell feeling mortified and dirty. I called my mom while I walked to the car and just as I usually do when I'm walking alone after dark. I told her about the appointment and right away she knew something didn't sound right, but I defended him. He explained why he was doing it. I don't want to talk about it. We fought as I drove. When I got back to campus, I asked a teammate if Larry, as she called him, had ever done anything similar to her. She said he wasn't a bit shy and had to do the same thing to her for another type of injury. I was able to convince myself what happened was a legitimate medical treatment. I never told anyone else. But the feeling of wrongdoing haunted my mom. Five years later, in January of 2016, she shared what happened with who I consider to be my second parents, my club gymnastics coaches. Suddenly, a new set of hard conversations began. Once again, I defended Mr. Nasser and rationalized what happened. I was now newly engaged and had to tell my soon-to-be husband that what was going on. I'll never forget the look on his face that day. He knew, just like my mom and coaches had known, something was off. I am so grateful for the bravery of Rachel Denhollander, which brought Mr. Nasser's disgusting actions to light and all of the other women who have come forward to form this army against him. It has given me the strength I didn't have back then. Although it was only a day or two before I spoke to the police after Rachel's interview, the guilt that I didn't say something years earlier will never go away. I was older. I should have trusted my gut. But then I came, I think back to all the conversations I had once everything initially came out and I know why I was so afraid. Even when there were so many people making accusations, many still defended his actions. There was a different skeptical tone in the voices of people within the gymnastics community when I told them what happened. The year and four months since the defendant's arrest have been some of the happiest and toughest days of my life. On September 13, 2016, I was just two months into a brand new job with all new coworkers. Can you imagine being surrounded by people you barely know coming to the realization that you were sexually assaulted and manipulated? Walking around your new office puffy-eyed with everyone asking if you're okay? Having to tell your brand new boss why you were an emotional wreck because you're staring at the computer with your mind in flashbacks a million miles away. How every time something small gets brought up, you feel consumed remembering all of the details and overcome with feelings. Can you imagine planning your wedding and being nervous to share your hometown with your future in-laws only to have them ask during the trip, have you seen all the stuff about that doctor on the news? Do you think he did it? Because they're just trying to make conversation with you, not knowing that you know he did. Can you imagine days before your wedding waking up to your mom yelling throughout the house because one of the Olympians bravely shared her story is all over the news and instantly you're consumed with your feelings again? Can you imagine preparing to leave for your honeymoon only to get a call t telling you that while you're out of town, the man that viol violated you will plead guilty but won't be prosecuted for what he did to you? These have been some of the highs and lows in my life over the past year and four months. I have so many more wonderful things to come in my life, and this ends the defendant's cloud over them. Today, I ask that for the rest of Larry Nasser's life, 
by receiving the maximum sentence possible, he thinks about how he changed all of ours. Because I'm not pretending it didn't happen anymore. I'm just moving past it. Thank you. And you just took a huge step to move past it. You are strong. You're not afraid anymore. And I love your comments about Rachel because it just takes one voice, one voice to reveal crime of any kind. And you all stand united saying no more, and not just against this defendant, but for all women. And that's one of the reasons I appreciate your comments thanking me and, and all of those, but I really am hoping that other judges allow extra victims who are not, as you say, not going to be a prosecution in your case, but ultimately it's a global resolution and you matter. You and all the other voices matter and that's why I'm allowing it and I'm hoping that this will become normal. I have to say it's normal in my courtroom, not thank just you. on this case. I think people think it's just on this case, but if you sat in my courtroom, I always allow victims their families to talk. And by the way, I do the same for defendants because that's important to mm -hmm. the families of defendants get affected. Yeah. And of course, the defendant will have an opportunity to speak. I don't know if he will. But it's really important that word spread about all types of crimes, but especially those against minors. So you are part of this strong army, as you've all called yourselves. I think you're all superheroes, with Rachel being your leader. Um, but you're not afraid. You're one very strong voice, and you're also individual voices who go out there in the world and will continue to speak. Yes. You don't have anything to be ashamed or afraid of or to cry about anymore. Leave it all here and go out and be happy because that's what you want and that's what you deserve. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. One moment to prepare for the next. It's going to be a little bit different. Okay, uh, the next um, speakers you're hearing from, the next survivors, are sisters. They are both minors. Come on up, girls. And they're going to be accompanied by their um, parents, their mother and their father, Dr. Uh, Johnson as well. Um, but I know that we want to make sure that we're making a record before I um, disclose their name. But I am told, and I want to make sure nothing has changed, or if it has to let me know, that they wish to be publicly identified. Is that Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I just have the parents step forward? I just need to make a record of this because it's important. Could you please each raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm in testimony you're about to provide to be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Yes, Thank you. Put your hands up. Could you please state by your name for the record, sir? You first. My name is Brad Johnson, B R A D J O H N S O N. All right. You can just stand. You're going to get. Oh. <laughs> in your neck. Uh, if you do that, we, we have a lot of technology, so we can uh, make it louder if we need to. Just okay. keep your voice louder. All right. Sure. And ma'am, your name? Uh, it's Kelly Johnson, K-E-L-L-I-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. All right. And you are the parents of the two beautiful sisters in back of you? Yes. Yes. And I understand that they are minors? Uh, one, one is. Okay. Which one? Maddie. Maddie. Right. And, what is, uh, and before you tell me her name, how old is she? Fifteen. 
15 and do you believe it's in her best interest to speak? We do. Yes. And you've talked about this with her? We yes. Have. And you know the whole world is watching her words, her voice, everything will be publicized or could be. Yes. Yes. And you think that she can handle that? We do. Yes. And no one has forced, threatened, coerced you, paid you anything, promised you anything for this. Is that correct? No. No. Right. Yes. That's correct or it's, correct? it's correct. That is correct. Right. It's one of those double negatives we in America do. I just need to make sure it's correct for the record. Yes. It's correct. Um, so at this time, I will ask your daughters to step forward and give me their name and spell their names. And you can get close to them or however you wish. And if they need help, you can give them a hug or whatever you need to do. All right. So for the record, who's going first? I am. The younger one. Oh, uh, older one. <laughs> the older one. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. And could you tell me your name? And spell it? Uh, my name's Kara Johnson, K-A-R-A-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. And I would just like to thank you again for letting us share our story. You Your Honor, I would like to address the, address the defendant. Okay. I am writing this in response to your actions, Mr. Nassar, for not following proper medical conduct and in result exploiting hundreds of young girls, including myself, at such a vulnerable time. The pain you have caused me mentally and emotionally is unexplainable and has been impacting my life heavily, especially these past few months. I am currently a senior in high school. I should be focusing on my classes, exams, upcoming tennis season, and college search. Instead, I am here and have been here for months, hoping that after this is all over, I can finally be a senior in high school again. You took advantage of your authoritative powers as my doctor, and in result took my innocence instead of healing me. I am hurt and confused, as you placed me into a position that not only made me insecure, but was extremely inappropriate and uncomfortable. I remember the anxiety I would have entering the office, knowing how the appointment would most likely go, and telling myself it was normal to feel that queasy ache in the pit of my stomach, that you were performing those procedures for the right reasons. I remember telling myself that you were safe and that I should trust you with my body, as you were a doctor for athletes across the country that I looked up to. My dad is a DO, and you knew that at the time when I was your patient. When he would show up to my appointments with me, you wouldn't do your typical procedure that I became used to you performing. I was uncomfortable at the appointments without my father, but maintained trust in you, as the framed images of the patients on your wall told an incredible story of a great doctor who could heal anyone. I remember the one appointment that has been played over and over in my mind and has given me nightmares still to this day. You had me get an x-ray for my hips and back and then check them out with a strange obsession on how my hips were not fully developed yet and that you could tell my period had not started. You then made me change into those strange shorts you had in your cabinet, shorts that were so big I was swimming in and that gave you easy access to my body. I was told to lay stomach down on the table where you proceeded to stack white towels between my mom and I and adjust the table to an angle where she couldn't see, which I remember feeling weird about. I immediately shut down all of those thoughts as I told myself you were going to fix me and that it was okay to feel uncomfortable, that you were going to heal my pain. You then pulled my shorts down, moved my underwear over to the side and started touching me without consent, without telling me what you were going to do, and if that wasn't bad enough, with your gloveless hands. You had your eyes closed and continued to molest me. After a few minutes of this, you just left the room, leaving my mom and I extremely uncomfortable while my bare butt was out. You came back into the room five minutes later with a tube of some kind of lubricant. You then continued this procedure using the lubricant, and I began to feel numb down there. I then at that point wondered how what you were doing would fix the pain I had from jamming my hip after a cross-country race. After about 30 minutes of this, you smacked my butt, said, all right, we are done here, sweetie, and then pulled up my shorts. You said quietly to me that if I was ever on my period during one of your appointments to let you know. 
so you could change things up a bit. After that appointment, I was supposed to go back to school, but everything seemed cloudy and I had the urge to shower, as I felt dirty and gross. I took a 45-minute shower that day and that feeling never left. I was only 13 years old. You manipulated me into believing that you were the only doctor that could fix me and that I had to have you or no one at all, and for so long I believed that to be true. I still cannot get over the grief that you have caused me by creating the false relationship of trust and custody. And I cannot believe that I felt safe and in good hands when I was with you. You fooled me, telling me of your family stories, telling jokes to, make, to attempt to make me more comfortable, and liking my social media posts. Some of the things that I now realize were major red flags and should have never been tolerated. I should have went with my gut and told someone that something felt very off. But how was I supposed to know at the age of 13 what was medically acceptable and what the boundaries were? I am disgusted by your actions and with the fact that even under investigation, you had the ability and power to continue these procedures on patients such as I without following the medical restrictions you were placed under. These few months have been extremely difficult to me, for me, as I have been struggling through depression and fighting off suicidal thoughts. I assumed I was going crazy, but after hearing all of these other girls speak, I am realizing that I am not crazy at all and that I am suffering from something you did to me for so many years. I, used, I never used to question the purpose of my life, and I never used to have nightmares about being raped, which is something that I am now extremely paranoid about, even though it has never happened to me. You have placed so much fear in my life, Larry, and I will never be able to get back what you have taken so effortlessly from me. Your actions, along with all of the other actions of abusers in this country, shall not go unnoticed. Trust is a hard thing to earn and personally has been something much harder to develop since you've molested me. I now know that I cannot second guess myself when it comes to decisions with my body and it sickens me to know that I was not the only one who had her innocence taken away without even truly knowing what was going on. It is terrifying how sick perpetrators like you are given the power to do such terrible things to innocent children for so long and almost get away with it. So many people believed you were innocent as you have brainwashed us all into believing that you were someone of great medical integrity. And I am angry at those who have been shutting down this case for so many years and who have not taken the degree of this sexual abuse seriously. I used to be sorry. I felt bad that you had to touch me and I grew very insecure. I am so glad that I no longer have to feel bad for you, and I'm glad that you will be paying for your actions the rest of your life. You are now a powerless man. God knows of all the innocent victims you took advantage of, and the acts of betrayal you have performed. The Lord is my shield, and I know that through him I am capable of all things, and that I will persevere through this, and that even the most evil of sins like the ones you have committed cannot destroy who I am and will have major consequences that will follow you for the rest of your life. God has, spoken to me for, God has spoken to me these past few days, and I'm finally starting to leave the dark place I have been in for so long. You cannot take advantage of me anymore, Mr. Nassar, and for that I am grateful. Due to your malpractice and of the pain you have caused all victims, I believe that you should be in prison for a minimum of 40 years to reflect on what you have done. Your Honor, I would like to thank you again for allowing me to share my statement today. You are very brave. You're not in darkness anymore. You're in lightness. You have just opened doors, along with your sister survivors, for others to speak out. And that's really important. And he can't fool you, as you've said, but he also can't fool anybody else who's heard your words. You're a tower of strength and with your sister I'm going to hear from in a moment your sister survivor you also have all of the sister survivors you are all in this horrible club but you know what it's also a great club because you're all towers of strength you're going to get past this and your message is being heard by the world I know you're going to graduate, congratulations, in high school, and go on to college and keep talking to men and women alike about this. 
because college is another place where we see this happening over and over and over again to young people who don't know or put themselves in bad situations. And I know you will be one of those voices that they will listen to. So you are a proud example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Please state and spell your name for the record. Madeline, M-A-D-E-L-I-N-E, -E, Johnson, J-O-H-N-S-O-N. And how old are you today? Fifteen. And you're comfortable speaking? Yes. All right, very good. You seem very confident. So I want to hear those words nice and loud, all right? All right. Thank you. Thank you. The first time I went to see Nassar, I was 12 years old. Being the little gymnast I was, I was beyond excited I had the opportunity to have Nassar as my doctor. He was spoken so highly of, as he was known as the gymnastics doctor. I was slowly injuring my back more and more with every practice, until one night, my pain was so bad, I couldn't even breathe without breaking down into tears. My parents were contemplating whether or not to take me to the ER, but my mom insisted she would just text Nassar to get me into an appointment, as this seemed like the most beneficial way to get treatment. My mom texted him, and he got me in right away the next day. I couldn't hardly wait to see Nassar, because with all of the stories I have heard about him supposedly treating Olympic gymnasts, I knew he was capable of finally relieving my back pain. When I walked into his office the next day, I was immediately in awe. His walls were covered with a substantial amount of pictures of Olympic gymnasts, all which included a little message and a signature. I felt so lucky that I got to have the same doctor as all of my idols in the gymnastics world, and the doctor was, who was known as the best of the best. My appointment with NASA this day was at least two hours long. After he addressed my injuries, he got started into the treatment. NASA approached so many different techniques, each one relieving my pain by a slight amount. Then, Nassar pulled on my leg to unjam my hip, and at this point, almost all of my back pain was gone, but he still continued to try to fix me. I felt his hands slowly make their way from my lower back down towards the seams of my shorts. He asked me to flip over onto my back, and as I was doing so, he jokingly told me that the next thing might be uncomfortable. Before I could even reply to his comment, he moved his hands up my shorts. He told me he was going to push on my pubic bone, but instead I felt his finger, fingers touch a different part of my body, a part of my body that has never touched but been touched by anyone before. I felt all of my muscles become tense, but I tried to tell myself to relax because he was a doctor and he knew what he was doing. The next appointment was just for my sister, but I went along too. She was wearing pants and he made her change into these shorts that he had in a box inside his cabinet. Because of this, I understood that it was also necessary for me to wear shorts every time I had an appointment. I later learned Nassar wanted us to wear loose-fitting shorts so he would have easy access to the places he wanted for his own pleasure. Soon enough, I was back in his office with back pain again. My mom decided my dad should take me to this appointment as he is a physician and he could attempt to learn what Nassar was doing so I wouldn't have to go into his office every time I hurt my back. I told my mom I did not want my dad to take me because that would be awkward. My mom asked, my, asked me why it would be awkward, but I didn't answer this question. I thought that if my mom didn't think what he was doing under my shorts was uncomfortable, then why should I? Before this appointment, I made sure I was showered as I was preparing for him to have to touch under my shorts again. Once we went over symptoms, he diagnosed me with the same thing as before. My dad was actively watching an attempt to learn what Nassar was doing to help treat me. During this appointment, Nassar didn't place his hands anywhere, near, anywhere on my bare skin. I didn't even have to remove my sweatpants to reveal my shorts I had under them. After this appointment, I remember thinking about him not doing the same things as he did before, but I never mentioned it as I felt uncomfortable talking about it, and it did not seem important or necessary to say. Once again, I injured my back. I followed through with the same routine of making sure I was clean before I went in and remembering to wear shorts under my sweatpants. By this time, my mom and I thought we were going to know what we were expecting, so my mom did not pay much attention to what Nassar was doing. I was lying on my back, and Nassar slowly slipped his hands up on up my shorts, this time saying nothing about what he was doing before he started. He didn't only touch inappropriate areas, but he moved my underwear to the side, and his ungloved hands massaged my bare skin. Once he began this, I looked over at my mom, but she was looking down. 
I looked at Nassar, only to see his body was blocking my hips, so even if my mom did look up, she could not see what he was doing to me. His face was turned away from me, his eyes closed and squinting, and he was heavily concentrated on what he was doing. Nassar did this for roughly five minutes, then said, Okay, kiddo, and made me turn over onto my stomach. He would then push on my lower back, which relieved pain for the moment, but once he stopped, it immediately returned. He asked me for my pain level, and I told him it was the same as before, the answer I'm sure he wanted to hear. He repeated this procedure several times until I realized the only way I could get him to stop was if I lied and said my pain was all gone. He had me lie on my back, and he yanked on my leg to unjam my hips, and that's when my back actually felt a little better. After this appointment, I knew my back was slowly getting worse, and Nassar's treatment was no longer helping me. I felt uncomfortable and extremely dirty after leaving these appointments. My mom asked me if my back actually felt better, and I lied to her saying, if, saying it did because I didn't want her to know that Nassar couldn't help me. I, didn't, I also didn't want her to question me on why I was lying to him about my pain levels. I felt so guilty and confused that I had felt uncomfortable with how this professional doctor with such a well-known reputation was treating me. Just as I was about to go to bed one night, an old friend texted me a video link. I clicked on the link not knowing what to expect. This video was Rachel's video. As she went on talking about Larry Nassar sexually abusing her, I was in shock. I didn't know what to think. I ran up the stairs to tell my mom all about this video, but before I could finish explaining myself, she told me she already saw it. My mom and I sat there in silence for a while, and I felt so sick. I was thinking about all the appointments I had with Nassar, trying to decide if this was abuse or strictly a doctor's treatment. I woke up the next morning, and I had felt a feeling I have never felt all 14 years of my life. I went to school and wanted nothing more than to be invisible the entire day. I did not want anyone to approach me, to talk to me, or to touch me. How I was feeling this day is difficult to describe, but it's something I will never forget and something I hope I never have to feel again. <coughs> For a while, I didn't believe I was one of these sexually abused victims. I later learned that this was not true. I tried rejecting the fact that I was molested by Nassar because it seemed like the easiest way to cope. I now know I was struggling so hard to decide if it was abuse or not because I knew if I admitted to myself that it was, it would change my life so much, and it did. I always knew what Nassar did to treat me was uncomfortable, but at only 12 years old, I had no idea that it was inappropriate, illegal, and wrong. He was the doctor, I was the child, I had no idea what to think. I will never be able to stress, en stress enough how much he manipulated my family and I so he could build a strong trust with us. We put all of our trust into this man, and he had such a high title and name to live up to in the gymnastics world and to athletes in general. Nassar spent so much time on me and acted like he really, truly cared about me. Your Honor, may I speak to the defendant? Larry, you used to be everything to all gymnasts and athletes, and now you are nothing more than a disgusting monster. You used your power and title to hurt me mentally and emotionally. You abused me, an innocent 12-year-old girl, for your own sick pleasures. You spent so much time on me, acting like you truly cared about me. Today, I am a 15-year-old girl, and throughout my years in high school, I have struggled with trust, confidence, good judgment, and for these past few weeks especially, achieving my academic goals. Everyone thinks of me as a physically and mentally strong person, but today I'm admitting to spending countless nights crying alone in my room, suffering from feeling worthless and lost. For the longest time, you deprived me of my happiness, the ability to sleep at night, and feeling of being secure. Because of you, every time I hear someone call me kiddo as you did, I think of the face you made while you were abusing me. You called me that, reassuring to yourself that I was a young, naive girl. There's a point in everyone's life when they outgrow those extraordinary dreams they had hoped they could achieve as a child, and reality kicks in. When they realize the world isn't what they used to think it was. Larry, you took this from me at 12 years old. I used to be such a joyful girl and believed everyone could be forgiven for the mistakes they had made. You made me afraid of the world. I will never forget about the pain I have suffered. But Larry, after today I will no longer suffer. But I will be joyful that you will never be able to lay your hands on another girl again. You will no longer deprive me of life. 
Your Honor, sometimes I think it would be easiest for me if I never knew about Nassar's abuse, but I quickly remind myself that this would be the worst case possible. If he wasn't behind bars now, he would be hurting more and more young girls with each day that passed. What he did will stick with us victims, will stay with us for the rest of our lives. Therefore, because we have to live with it, he should be sentenced to the maximum amount of years and locked up for the rest of his life. Thank you. Thank you. I have heard you and your sister and your sister survivors speaking out as you have done and your sister has done as all the victims have done, so victim survivors have done, helps others. And I hear that loud and clear in your insightful and youthful voice. That's what you want to do and that's one of the reasons you and your sister are here. The world is a better place because of what you've just said and done. And both of you should be very proud of yourself. I know that now you don't feel like the world is a great place, but it really, really is. I've heard what all of you have said, and you're so wise at your tender age, and I'm taking into consideration everything I've heard to sentence in. You are both worthy of everything wonderful. You don't let him take that away from you. <coughs> then he wins. And I know that your sister talked about suicide. You didn't, but I suspect you, like most of the other survivor victims, have thought about it. Please, don't. You're here today because you want a happier world and a happier life. If you leave us, he wins. I've said it to others, I'll keep saying it, because suicide is never, ever an answer. We have some incredible parents here with you. So if there are any issues, I hope that you turn to them and continue to get help. He will be by the heart, and that should make you feel safer. And you should leave the grief and sadness and unworthiness here in this corridor. We'll sweep it away. We take him away. Thank you. Live happy lives. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Could I read a short statement? Yes, you may. Okay. I'm here today to address Larry Nassar, both in his, an osteopathic physician and the father of two beautiful girls that were cared and abused by you. Before I begin, I would like to say how proud I am of each and every survivor in this courtroom. I will never forget your stories and the pain in your voices as you so courageously tell all those stories that we've heard. As a physician, we are given the great privilege to care for our patients. What a wonderful and beautiful privilege this is. Our patients trust us with their most intimate problems, their fears, their bodies, and their history. They trust that we will care for them with compassion and respect and love, that we will do no harm. They place their trust in us without knowing us because we are physicians. <laughs> we make mistakes. And occasionally, these unintentional mistakes cause harm. This causes us great pain. We carry these stories with us forever, never forgetting the patient we harmed, and never forgetting the pain we caused. We learn from this, and we try to improve and become better caregivers, better physicians. This is not your story, Larry. <coughs> the pain you caused was intentional. You did not care for these young girls with compassion, respect, and love. Your care was selfish, not selfless. Your story is dark, sinister, and pure evil. You preyed on the most vulnerable. You preyed on innocence and you preyed on trust. You preyed on little girls and young women, God's children, and he weeps with us. Your story is very different, Larry. Your story starts with sick, perverse, and ungodly intentions. You are not a physician. You are a pedophile. You only used your degree as a platform to sexually abuse your patients, one by one, for your sick and your very perverse pleasure. You groomed your victims and plotted a course full of deceit and abuse. 
I hope that you have heard each and every story. And I pray that these voices resonate in you forever. You were once known as one of the elite physicians in your profession. Now and forever, you will go down in history as one of the worst humankind has to offer. A child molester, a predator, an abuser, a pedophile. You cannot escape this identity. And to each and every institution that deny responsibility for this, shame on you. For a moment, I ask that you close your eyes and think of your daughter. Do you remember her innocence? Can you see her smile? Hear her youthful laughter? Now imagine her being sexually assaulted by this man. Can you hear her scream? Or is it silent? This is our reality, and these were our children. If after that disturbing thought, after that disturbing image, you can continue to deny responsibility for fostering this abuse and allowing this monster to continue with his practice, then you have denied the truth. You have learned nothing. These institutions emphasize the importance of safe spaces. Ironically, the only safe place that was created was a safe place for Larry Nassar to molest children and young women without boundaries and without oversight. I ask you, where was a safe place for all the abused, for all of these survivors? Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry. May we have a copy of what you said? Yes, you may. Have. Have no, you don't. All right. Yes. Sir, I know you're speaking on behalf of your daughters, but really you're speaking on behalf of all children, and you know as a trained physician, as a good physician, that's what you are to do. And I'm so thankful that you're here and for your words because Everybody needs to hear that, and doctors need to be reminded of that. Patients need to be reminded that they can tell you anything, and if something's wrong, tell another doctor who will report it. And hopefully we have that change, because so many people didn't report here. And that's why it's so important for you all to be here. So I applaud you, and I know that your children are in great hands, and I can't thank you enough. Thank you. I um, just realized, as I've done in prior mornings, that I have not updated the court as to the number of impact statements. As of this morning, um, that number is 120. Well, and as I've said, I'll give you as much time as you need in clearing out my docket as we speak. <clears throat> so for those of you who want to be here, it looks like with that number, we'll see where we land today, we may be <coughs> into Tuesday although we're going pretty rapidly. I, I don't know. I just don't want to give anybody a hope that we'll finish Monday. It sounds to me like it may be Tuesday, and every day there's more added. So we'll see. Your Honor, the next survivor to speak is Marie Anderson. And um, I believe she just recently, I decided to um, be publicly identified. Um, she is accompanied by her parents, and I have a photograph of her on the screen as well. Thank you, Mom and Dad, you can if you would like, next yes. to her. You ready? Yes. State and spell your <laughs> name for the record, and then once you read, please read. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Please state your name. Marie Anderson. M A R I E A N D E R S O N. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> I'm here today to talk with you about my experiences with Larry Nassar at Michigan State University sports medicine when I was 15 years old. I was a swimmer 
and having issues with my lower back. During my visits to MSU for back pain, Larry claimed that I needed pelvic adjustments. He would have me lie on the exam table, face up, and place my legs open like you would during a vaginal exam, but without stirrups. He would move his fingers around the outside of my vagina and anus. Then he would insert his fingers into my vagina and move them around inside of me, as well as move his fingers in and out. While his fingers were inside of me, he would also apply pressure with his other hand to the outside of my lower abdomen and massage the inside and outside of my vaginal area. This happened visit after visit. Saying this out loud to you is extremely uncomfortable for me, and I'm sure for everyone who is listening. It is supposed to be uncomfortable. I would be doing myself and the other brave women here a great disservice by shying away from what is now my truth. As I discover that this invasive treatment was not in the best interest of my health, I cannot help but reflect on the impact the entire treatment plan had during an impressionable time in my life. At the age of 15, I was naive to sexual intercourse and recall pain and embarrassment. I had my mom or dad in the room that to my humiliation witnessed this happening, all under the impression that they were taking me to the best available. The impact this has had on my family is indescribable. My parents, who had my best interest at heart, will forever have to live with the fact that they continually brought their daughter to a sexual predator and were in the room as he assaulted me. I wonder if the treatment plan Larry created was intended to keep me coming back in order to continue the assault. As I look back at the treatment, I remember I did not find relief with the methods that he used. I was in a full back brace and on crutches under his treatment plan. I was a sophomore in high school and I experienced a magnitude of harsh mocking from my peers because of the large brace over my clothes paired with the crutches. This led to a multitude of hurdles, including a lack of confidence and difficulty in social situations that I still face today. I visited a therapist to discuss these issues, and I believe I will need to continue therapy for these issues as well as the realization that I am a victim of sexual assault. The impact this continued assault had on my childhood and my growth as an adult is something I'm forced to conf confront and will cope with indefinitely. My perspective of medical professionals is damaged and I have a difficult time trusting treatment opinions because I feel that I have been deceived, manipulated, and used to satisfy Larry's sexual desires. I will never regain what I've lost. And I will learn to cope with a lack of faith in a system that failed me. From Larry Nassar to the institutions that supported him for many, many years. As an alumni of Michigan State University, I am disgusted to my core that this man 
was able to harm so many under their responsibility. The pride I had in my alma mater is tarnished and diminishing as this continues to progress. I didn't choose to stand and publicly share my story until earlier this week. Last year, when headlines started coming out about the assault, and I had filed my report, I was sitting alone for lunch at McAllister's Deli. It was crowded, and the ladies sitting at the table next to me were having a conversation about their friend, Larry. I sat frozen as they talked about these girls who were making up these lies just for the attention. Little did they know that one of those girls who I promise you would have been very happy with no attention at all was sitting next to them with tears falling down onto her plate. As I stand here today, I am not the woman sitting in McAllister's unable to find the voice to give these grown women a piece of her mind. I am also not the 15-year-old kid afraid of disappointing the adults in her life. I am able to stand here today in front of my abuser with an army of strong, powerful women behind me asking that this man, that hurt all of us, withers away for the rest of his life. I have a choice to make every day on how I will grow. And while we all are moving mountains, you, Larry, will have no choice but to sit in prison and wait to die. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you so much. You aren't just moving mountains, you are saving others' lives as well who have heard your strong voice. You are strong and powerful to the core. You are confident. You are more than just a survivor victim. I think you are unstoppable. Your words ring so true and they are meaningful beyond this courtroom, beyond this town. Um, across the world, people are hearing you and you're making a difference. You're not letting those other people who didn't listen to you, who didn't want to listen to you, who are in that next booth, not knowing who you are. They know who you are. We have heard you. You are strong. You've made a tidal wave and it's growing. Thank you so much for being here. You're amazing. Thank you, Your Honor. Judge, I'm told the next survivor um, initially had asked us to read on her behalf, but she is going to be reading this. Is that my understanding? Yes. Okay. And you know what? Your Honor, this is Amy Lavity, and her mother and her boyfriend are accompanying her at the podium. And I have um, <coughs> placed on the screen a photograph of Amy as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Could you please state and spell your name for the record? Yes. Amy Lavity, A-M-Y-L-A-B-A-D-I-E. Thank you. What would you like me to know? 
On September 12th, 2016, I was getting ready for bed and was on my phone looking through news articles and came across the article that was published in the Indy Star about Nassar, former USA gymnastics doctor accused of abuse. I can still remember reading this and not being able to comprehend what I was reading at first and thinking, there is no way this is true. This can't be true. I remember telling Steve, did you read the article about the gymnastics doctor? And him asking me. I gave him a brief recount about the victim and what Nassar did to her. I remember him saying something like, it's horrible world sometimes. I guess we will see how it unfolds. And then I just dropped to the floor. I swear I went completely blank after that and it almost felt like I blacked out from the world. I know he asked me if that happened to me and I told him yes, but went silent with words for the majority of the night. It was one of those cries so intense that you can't speak. I was in complete shock and had no idea at the time the immense emotions my body was going through. Steve just kept trying to hug me and I kept pushing away and sobbing. The next day, I went through the work day feeling the worst I have ever felt in my entire life, not knowing how I was going to tell my mom. When I got home from work, I took my dog for a walk and then called her. I asked her if she had read the article. She said no. I explained that I was about to tell her something horrible, that it was not her fault. I told her about Nassar molesting me during the doctor's visits at MSU Sports Medicine when, he went down there for, when we went down there for my back injury. I told her I couldn't believe that I didn't know he molested me until I read the article. She asked me questions like, what do you mean? I was in the room with you. How could he have done this to you while I was there? I had to explain that he must have done it in a way that he could not, that she could not see his hands. I asked her if Nassar asked if he could do this to me or if she could think of any reason why this could be. She said no to all of it. I remember being in complete denial, hoping my mom could do what she always does and comfort me as she always does. But nothing she said to me could take away the shock that was running through my body. I loved gymnastics. I started at the age of seven or eight and was competing level five by the age of nine. It was everything to me to put on my long sleeve Leo, warm up jacket, slick back my hair with an inch of gel, so tightly secured with my scrunchies. I competed all the way through high school. My family devoted so much time to driving me to practice four to five days a week and traveling around the state and country to meet all these years. In August of 2005, I sought out NASA in hopes of getting treatment for my back. It was recommended I go see him after months and months of pain. He was said to be a world-renowned doctor, the best gymnastics doctor in the world. It made me and everybody that knew him believe he was a doctor that could fix you. Frankly, I was starstruck to even be walking into his office. Doctors of his high of stature and any doctor are to be inherently trusted. I now realize this level of celebrity status was a strong basis for his manipulation. Between August and December of 05, I went down to Michigan State Sports Medicine office three to four times. The first time I walked into his office, he had me put on these shorts. They had a, a drawstring, but the bottoms of these shorts were really wide. There was no one else in the room aside from my mother and gymnastics coach. 
When he put his fingers in my vagina and anus, he would move my legs back and forth while holding my knee. I remember the pain I felt from him rubbing my legs and back. I remember this lasting for a long time. He sexually assaulted me while he was supposed to be healing me. He did this for the pleasure of his own good, not for any other reason. I ended up getting a bacterial infection after he did this one of the times because he put his fingers from my anus to my vagina without gloves. He never wore gloves when he did this. I had no idea what he was doing and that it was sexual assault or any type of abuse. As a 16 year old, I had never, touched, I had never been touched in this way before. But looking back on it now, it is absolutely disgusting to think about. The same thing happened every single time I saw him at Michigan State University. In January of 06, I was at my uh, team's season kickoff meet, the Vegas style invitational in Lansing, Michigan, hosted by Twist Stars Gymnastics and the infamous John Geddert. This was always my favorite meet of the year, not only because it was the first meet of the year, but also because Twist Stars was known as the best gym in the state. I always wished my parents would move to Lansing so I could go to Twist Stars. Little did I know. It was at this meet that I was sexually assaulted on two separate occasions by Nassar. He took me into the back locker room that connected between the meet and the Twist Stars training gym. I remember my mom asking, do you want me to come with you two? And him saying no. He had me take my clothes off and molested me on the training table. He then had me put my Leo back on. We went into the Twist Stars gym while he watched me flip. He molested me again and sent me on my way to my competition. My vagina was sore during my competition because of this man. How disgusting is that to even say out loud? It baffles me that John Geddard would knowingly allow his team's doctor to see patients during their hosted meet with no documentation of who Nassar was seeing or what they were being treated for. Actually, it doesn't baffle me at all. It makes perfect sense. John Geddard was Larry Nassar's Bonnie to his Clyde. As much as we would like to sit here and think Nassar got away with this and no one knew, that's bullshit. John knew. I went to school at Michigan State University from 2007 to 2011 and graduated with a degree from Eli Broad College of Business. One of the main reasons I chose this school is because I accepted the position of the team manager for MSU Gymnastics. I was the manager for the team for three years. I volunteered 20 to 40 hours a week during school to go to all the practices, travel to all the meets, and spend countless hours building team camaraderie outside of the gym. I loved it. I loved the girls. I loved the dedication and surely loved being in the gym. I used to be so proud to tell people I was the manager of the gymnastics team. I gave MSU my everything. But that has all changed now. I can't get over the fact that MSU could have done something to prevent this from happening to me. And the individuals that turned a blind eye to the monster that is Larry Nassar. I no longer have I am proud to have graduated from Michigan State University. I have lost all hope that the institution of this stature is trustworthy and has the students' and athletes' best interest at heart. I have suffered mentally over the last year and a half, which has greatly affected my home and work life. I will out of nowhere become angry and get in fights with my boyfriend about things that I never would have in the past. I sometimes take it out on Steve like it's his fault, but it's not. I just can't get this monster out of my head. 
I used to be able to work much more efficiently and never let my emotions get in the way of my success. The depression from this has caused me to miss work more than I ever used to and not be able to stay positive on work days. It is impossible to suppress the negative emotions and anger that are from Nassar's conduct. I am doing my best to keep this job and pray every day that I get through this. I know I'm going to have to seek medical advice to get through all of this. You have to understand though, it's not easy even thinking about going to see a doctor. I don't trust doctors anymore. Now I will always struggle with letting someone who is called the doctor try to fix you. I feel like I have lost all enjoyment in life. I've never been depressed before and used to not think depression was even a thing. Until now. I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to take a shower. I don't want to go out of my house or do anything. I used to go do yoga and play sports with my boyfriend and I haven't done any of that since I found out Nasser assaulted me. I used to spend time with my friends and enjoy myself. But I just feel like I am too anxious and stressed out now to be around anyone. I have lost countless hours of sleep. I have been struggling with the worst nightmares ever. I have lost weight and have trouble eating sometimes because I don't have an appetite. It's disgusting. What Nassar did is affecting my whole life. Work, friendships, my family, my sexual relationship, my physical and mental state. It's hard to see into the future and think that this will not affect me forever. Any way you look at it, I am fearful that if justice is not served, this sets a precedent for other medical professionals out there that could be doing the same thing. All that I can hope for now is that seeing him locked up behind bars for the rest of his life for what he has done to me and all of us will bring some peace in knowing that he will never see the light of day again. I also strongly hope that me standing here today giving this horrifying impact statement will provide all of the people of this world the strength to know when a monster is in front of your face and that no job, no status, no level of greatness, and no gold medals are worth hundreds of little girls being sexually assaulted. We must find a way to prevent this from happening ever again. Children are naive and do not have voices, but we as adults do. The force of these other women and myself is fierce. Come hell or high water, we will take every last one of you down that could have stopped this monster. Thank you. Thank you. Your words, your fierce words, your fierceness will help prevent not only this, what you say, the monster, I'm not disagreeing, but using your words, this monster, you will prevent him and others like him with your fierceness. I need you to leave your nightmares here with him between the federal court, this court, and Judge Cunningham. He's not getting out. You've given him a nightmare. One that he will relive over and over again. You are joining with your sister survivors in strength in numbers. The numbers are growing. And your voice matters. You matter. Get out, enjoy your life, because without that, he's winning. Don't let him win. You're right, gold medals, all of that, nothing matters. Life matters. You need to live yours. 
can have a golden life. I want you to live it. Okay. Can you do that? Yes, I can. All right. I love the smiles. Back. Thank you. Keep it. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Judge, the next survivor to speak um, just also made the decision to, to be publicly identified. This is Ashley Yost. And Ashley's mom. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Ashley Yost. I'm Ashley Yost. A-S-H-L-E-Y-Y-O-S-T. All right. We're right up to the podium, <laughs> so you're next to that microphone. Keep your voice up and just talk at a pace we can understand. And your mom is here with you, is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, Mom, if you need to hug her, you're holding hands. That's great. Ready to proceed? Yes. Please do. First, I would like to thank you for allowing not only me, but every other survivor of Larry Nassar speak their truth and have their voices heard. Your Honor, I've started and restarted this impact statement multiple times. That's because I never really knew where to begin. I also feel that Larry Nassar doesn't deserve to know how I've been impacted. He doesn't deserve to know anything about me, my life anymore. But this letter isn't for him. It's for you, Judge Aquilina. It's to show you the gravity of his actions and who I am now because of him. This is why I chose today, chose to be here today and chose to read this letter myself in front of everyone. I still don't know where, where to really start this. Everything about this whole situation is chaotic and messy and my thoughts are never very clear. It feels like I have so much to say about everything, but yet nothing at the same time. Can you say it a little bit slower? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. See. My mind can't really focus on what Larry Nassar did for too long because it seems like it'll be just too much if I do. I thought I knew Nassar. We all thought we did. When I was 16, I job shadowed him in high school. He was the reason I was so interested in the medical field and specializing in sports medicine. He was the reason I wanted to help gymnasts in the future. When I was still thinking of becoming a doctor, I thought it would be the most amazing thing in the world to somehow have him as a mentor. Now I know how wrong all of his intentions were. The first time I stepped into one of the two exam rooms Larry Nassar had at MSU Sports Med, I was 12. The last time was in June of 2016, making me 24. That's 12 years of knowing him and one half of my life being treated by him. He had a reputation for being one of the best gymnastic sports medicine doctors in the world. And for him to be located so close to where I live seemed like the best luck ever. It was only when I reflected on that very first report by Rachel Den Hollander that I began to put the pieces together. Larry Nassar was not treating me, but using me. He was not the best gymnastic sports medicine doctor. He misused his role of power in order to abuse dedicated and hardworking athletes. I don't even consider him to be a doctor anymore because a true doctor cares for their patient's well-being while he narcissistically manipulated his. In Nassar's exam rooms, there were pictures, letters, and gifts dedicated to him from his patients and thinks of how much he had helped them. I always loved walking around the room and reading them, trying to find out the newest things of his. Now I see that these were all just trophies to him. He got to see every day how he manipulated people while they had no idea what was going on. He gave me a pen from one of the Olympics he had attended. It made me feel so special at the time. I had it sitting out on my desk and always noticed it whenever I walked by. Now it makes me feel sick. He wanted me to feel special. 
He wanted me to feel like he really cared because that's what a person like him does. He would always ask about my family and how they were doing, as well as sharing how his family was doing. He would call me Goof, or my Ashley, sometimes, and I thought it was out of care and kindness. Now I see how wrong all of that was and how he manipulated me into thinking he actually cared. I also look back seeing how unnecessary his actions were. There were times when he would go through his routine, but without penetration, and I would still feel better. It only clicked with me after all the news reports how he never should have had to use penetration in the first place if I was able to feel better without it. It also makes sense how he used distraction to never really let me think about what he was doing. He would hold a conversation with me for the entirety of the visit so that I would have something to focus on. He used his personal life and his family to make it seem as if he actually cared and would ask about mine as well. It's difficult to say how his actions have fully impacted me. I think that's because I still haven't completely processed everything. Part of me wants to believe that this is all just some horrible nightmare and everything is okay. The other part knows that that's what grooming does to you. It makes you second guess yourself and question reality. It makes you want to feel sympathy towards your assaulter. Because I was groomed for so long starting at such a young age, this whole ordeal is still something I struggle with. There's one part of me that when hearing the other girls' stories of how he made them feel special has actually made me feel hurt. I know that this reaction is the result of what he did to me. However, there's another part of me that knows I'm a part of this community of strong, and powerful, beautiful, courageous women. In the very beginning of all this, it was difficult to think that he was capable of being this type of person, a monster. My mind fully rejected the thought in the beginning and for a long time, despite eventually acknowledging the situation, I would dissociate myself from being a part of it. I'm slowly accepting everything for what it is and working on seeing Nassar for the monster he is. That is also why I chose to be here today. The last time I saw Larry, he was still this well-renowned doctor who knew how to help me with my back pain. I was sad that I was going to be treated by him anymore. The, the mental image I still have is a positive one. I needed to be here today so that I can change that. I need to see what my new reality is. I need to change 12 years worth of knowing a person and feeling, and feeling that I could trust them completely. I have been in therapy every week for the past year plus now trying to learn coping skills from my fears and learning to trust myself and instincts again. In the past, I have struggled with anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts with no explanation. This was prior to understanding what NASA had been really doing to me. I still struggle with anxiety and depression, and although I have yet to completely accept all the events that have happened this past year, I do have these moments where reality hits me, and it hits hard. I feel like I can't breathe, I can't think straight, and everything feels upside down. And this is something my family has to deal with. Sorry. They have, they have to watch me have these breakdowns and I know it hurts them because there's nothing they can really do to help. I have to work through it on my own. My brain has to My brain has to process the magnitude of the situation. I still try to keep my breakdowns private so that my family doesn't have to suffer the consequences of Nassar's actions. But I remember one breakdown in particular. Would you like a chair, ma'am? No, sorry, I can't see because this here is real quick. <laughs> oh. That would be helpful. <laughs> Do you know where it was? Okay. I had a complete moment of clarity and understanding of who Nazar really is and what he's done, and I ran into my parents' room sobbing out of control. 
I remember grabbing my head and banging it on the bed trying to get the thoughts out. I also remember vaguely hearing my parents in the background trying to calm me down. It took a while, but I managed to calm down with their help and sleeping in their bed for the rest of the night. That's something a 25-year-old shouldn't have to do, sleep in their parents' bed because they're afraid of the monster. But it's happened more than once now, and to be honest, I'm not sure when it will stop. Another thing that's affected me is how I view, doc how I view doctors. I'm very picky about what doctor I see, and that's because I was born with an auto-inflammatory disease. Larry Nassar used to be one of my favorite doctors. It always seemed like he was trying to help my disease, but make it better, and I was so grateful for that. Now I know this was a part of his manipulation. I never know, I'll never know if he truly cared about my disease and my health, or if it was all just a facade in order to get me to see him again. Now when I see doctors, I can't help but second guess their intentions, and I'm never alone with them. I need someone there with me in order to feel comfortable and safe. This is also something a 25-year-old shouldn't have to do. Right now, because of all of this, I don't trust males at all. Apart from my immediate family and only a few select friends, I don't want to have any interaction with them. I don't like them being near me. I don't like having to talk to them. And the thought of ever being in a relationship right now makes me feel nauseated. This response might seem extreme, but I can't seem to help it right now. My anxiety skyrockets whenever I have to interact with a guy. My anxiety seems to worsen in general. Things that shouldn't make me anxious in life now cause me worry. At times there doesn't have to be anything going wrong for me to all of a sudden feel this heavy weight on my chest and like I can't breathe. These types of attacks happen more often than I wish they did. And when I'm in that moment, it seems as if it will never stop. The hardest part about this whole thing is that I'll never know why. Why Larry Nassau did this. Why he chose to prey on children. And what his fascination with gymnastics is. I'll never know if he even cared about the health of his patients or if being a doctor was just a way to get easier access to victims. Has he always been like this? Or did he become like this over time? As someone who has their degree in psychology, I will never understand why all of this happened. It's one thing to be an outside observer to something such as this than it is to have it directly happen to you. The fact that I'll never have answers to so many questions is something I struggle with daily. I know that accepting this fact is something that I'll have to come to terms with, but right now I'm still confused, angry, and hurt. I think a part of me will always be this way, and the feeling will just get less and less over time. I know I'll never be the same person that I was before I found out the truth. So much about me and the way I view life has changed. Some of it good and some bad. I also know that my brain is still continuing to absorb and process all the information, and that's okay. One day, I will have complete clarity of the person Larry Nassar is, and I'll be able to handle it. I know my breakdowns and anxiety attacks are temporary. I know that even though sometimes Sometimes I just want to give in and hide away from everyone. I'm stronger than what happened to me. I refuse to let a monster control the rest of my life. So even if my voice has been shaking this entire time, or I've started to cry, it doesn't matter. I'm here, standing on my own two feet, in front of my assaulter. And I hope he and everyone else in this room knows who will win this battle in the end. Thank you. You and your sister survived this one, and Rachel started it. You are all winning. All of us judges have heard you. I hear you in regard to sentencing. You can't make sense of crime. Your why will not be answered. I know. I think that's okay with you. You are in control. You can prove that here today. You need to leave your anxiety here and live your life. There's nothing confusing about what you said. You said in what you read that you're confused. You're not confused. You have clarity. You've got that because you were writing that idea. And as you stand here publicly and acknowledge that you are strong, that you are able to face him on what he did, 
you are helping heal not just yourself but countless others and making others strong with your words. That counts for so much. I've heard you. I will do the right thing. I hope. Maybe not everybody will agree with it. That's my decision to make. But you and your sister survivors have been and will be part of all of that. Stand tall. Keep talking. You are in control. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.